Jesus' name and thank you very much uh, for joining us. I trust you've had a wonderful week. The Lord is reaching you, ministering to you and gracing you over this season. One of the things that we have believed and uh, we have declared and continue to declare is that this season we will rise. And uh, I took time to paint a picture for you that in times of famines, in times of storms, in times of pandemics, the people of God can either choose to go down with the whirlwind or connect to the stability of the power of God that enables our foundations to refuse to be shaken. And uh, we've been praying for you. We've been declaring over your life and uh, asking God that he will hold you together over this season. And of course, the ongoing series has been um, a reconnection uh, to the power of God uh, that enables us to get anchored even when there are challenges. And I've been giving you several anchors that we see in God's word. And today I just want to kind of uh, bring to a close um, the, the sets of anchors that we've been sharing. And then I'll go on to just share a few more things and then we will close uh, this series. But before we can do that, I want to just pick up with uh, a few of the anchors that I want to give you today. And God has laid a few things in my heart that I pray and hope that as you connect with and as you listen to today, that um, they will once again become a gate into your life that will position you in the way God wants you to be positioned. And so um, the next anchor, which is my first point today, and I believe uh, anchor number 11 on our ongoing series is, um, is the wonder of communion, connecting to God through communion. Now, communion, of course, is when we come to the Lord's table and we take, we take the bread and uh, drink of the cup as a way of opening the gates of our lives and the details of our lives uh, to the power that is fresh from heaven that comes down to us. And I just want to remind you, this is a time to come to the table of communion with a fresh revelation. And as often as you're able to do that, I want to... I uh, just trust that uh, you will be able to just have fresh power and grace resting over you. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and if you have not connected and reconnected uh, to Jesus, and you're not actively following Jesus, the Bible, of course, warns that uh, taking communion is eating and drinking our own judgment. So if you have Jesus Christ and an active walk with Jesus in your heart, this is for you, communion. Just that wonder of communion, connecting to Jesus uh, through that communion over this season. And so what I want to do is um, to just remind you the wonder of communion and the power that settles in our lives as we receive uh, communion. Now, number one is that it, communion is a way of ushering in the life of God. The, the realities of heaven where nothing ever changes, the realities of heaven where Satan cannot enter there and change or affect anything, the realities of heaven bringing them down to your life, to your situation down here on earth. Now where do I draw that from? John chapter number 6, verse number 35. And uh, uh, verse number 46 uh, going down, it tells us that Jesus is a bread of heaven. He is a bread that came down from heaven and uh, came here to introduce the life of heaven to us here on earth. And so Jesus came carrying a certain life. Realities, spiritual realities, divine realities with him. And he says he came as a bread of life. The bread of life. And so uh, John chapter number 6, verse number 35, and then verse number 46 uh, going down, it tells us that when we eat the bread of God, the bread of heaven rather, uh, into our lives by faith, we meditate on that as we take the bread of heaven, what happens is that we usher in the life of heaven into our lives. We actually allow the life of heaven into our situations and circumstances. And I want to just remind you this season, as you settle there as a couple, as you sit on that table, as you go to your business and sit on that seat where you transact business from, and you take communion, 
as, as, as you allow that power that was brought from heaven to again enter uh, and, and uh, allow encounters of that bread of heaven into your business, into your life, into your career, into the things that you're doing and you're usually involved in, uh, there is a life that gets ushered as you do it by faith and as you just allow that life and grace uh, to flow into your life. And I want to just remind you that that's the power that you need to every so often allow into your life as, as you uh, trust God. Now, the other thing is um, uh, it swallows poison. It, it, uh, it takes away the poison that we gather and collect. There's a very interesting story that is given in 2 Kings chapter number 4, verse number 38 to 41, that when the children, the, the, the sons of the prophet, went down collecting some uh, vine, they went into the field, there was a famine, and, uh, you know, they went and the prophet told them, you go and collect some, you know, have some uh, vines, and they went and did that, but unbeknownst to them, as they were collecting the vines, one of them picked some uh, wild gourds. Um, and then so they came and put it uh, in the pot and they made the stew. And when the pottage was served, as they were eating, they realized that there was death in the pot. And the Bible doesn't tell us how exactly the death manifested. But evidently, uh, some, they started to exhibit certain signs. Uh, maybe people started to sweat, to vomit, to cough, uh, you know, continually, and so on and so forth. Fever went up. Uh, they started to maybe exhibit flu-like symptoms. We don't know. Uh, but So they looked at those that had gone ahead in eating that pottage, and they saw that there was something about their reactions that was actually showing that there was death. Uh, in that pot. And so they went to the man of God and said, hey, look, there is um, there's death in the pot. And so what happened is that the man of God did not go removing the poison or did not say, pour this out, let's make another stew. He actually just got some flour and poured it in. That flour is what they used to make the bread. And that, of course, was symbolic in the Old Testament. It was a way of showing that, um, you know, the bread of life, when we eat the bread that came from heaven, uh, when we drink of the cup, it has a way of neutralizing the poison. And so when he poured some flour, as though to say, I'm introducing the bread of heaven, what happened is that, you know, the poison that was in the pot there got neutralized. And so he told them, go ahead and eat. And when they were eating, the Bible said the poison was no more. And so there's a poison of uh, a collapsing economy. There's a poison of uh, uh, COVID-19 and its related challenges that of course is flying left, right and center. And one of the ways to kill that poison uh, that you know is killing, that is killing our businesses, our economies, our lives and so on and so forth is to introduce the bread from heaven. And I want you as you do that over this season to trust God that that life, that bread of heaven is actually going to uh, stabilize you. It's going to be stabilizing you. It's going to be gracing you to just enjoy, enjoy uh, power and help uh, from above that will ensure that you're stabilized. Now, the other thing I want to just remind you about communion is that it opens your eyes. There's a very interesting story in Luke chapter number 24, verse number 25 to 32, where disciples were walking down the road to a mouse. And while they were walking there, they were talking, saying, oh, uh, how sad it was that Jesus had come into this world and they had killed him. They had, um, you know, short-circuited great things that God wanted to do to the people of Jerusalem and so on and so forth, the Messiah had come, and Jesus joins them. And when he joined them, they actually did not know that it was Jesus. Their eyes were, there were veils over their eyes, a kind of scales that wouldn't let them see that this was Jesus. But the Bible says they went, uh, sat somewhere, and Jesus served them the table, the communion. And when it was served to them, the Bible says uh, their eyes were open and they even realized that this was Jesus. Their hearts were warmed up. There's a power that came into their lives um, that warmed up their hearts and caused their eyes to be open to see things that they were not seeing before. Let me tell you, communion introduces power and ability for our eyes to be open, to see things, ideas, to connect with possibilities strategies that we had never seen before. And let me tell you, one of the things to allow the power from heaven, to allow you to see ideas, to see strategies, 
and tactics, ideas on how to turn around your business, your career and your life. How to, what to do at this time is to actually sit down and tell the Lord as I eat communion, as I take your bread that came from heaven, and as I drink of your cup, I declare my eyes are going to be open. I will see the things that I need to see, the strategies for my career that I need to see and understand over this time. I declare that I am seeing them. My eyes are being opened. And so one of the ways to get your eyes open to how to take your life and your career and your finances to the next level is one of those ways is to actually take in communion. As you do that, you believe that your eyes will be open, will be open to certain realities and uh, wisdom, strategies and nuggets that God wants to send your direction. And so the next uh, thing that I want to just remind you is that when we take communion, we actually becomes a way of overtaking and overcoming Satan. The Bible says in Revelation chapter number 12, verse number 11, that they overcame him, the enemy, by the blood of a lamb. When we take in that cup of the blood, one of the ways that we do is to overcome. And I can assure you, there are many things that we need to overcome over this season. We need to overcome the disease itself, the infection. But we also need to overcome many other related things that have come with COVID-19. All the challenges that we're all facing. You know, things are shutting down and being locked up and being quarantined. Those are things that we must overcome. You see, sickness does not come from God. Uh, disease does not come from God. And so all its related challenges, we need to overcome it. And one of the ways to overcome the enemy is through the blood of a lamp. One of the ways to activate the blood of a lamp is actually by taking the cup uh, of the blood of Jesus that was shed for us on our behalf. And so this season, this season, the Bible says the life of any animal, Le Le uh, Leviticus, sorry, chapter number 17, verse number 11, uh, one of the ways to, uh, the, the, or rather the blood of any animal is actually, the life of any animal rather is in its blood. And so when we take the cup of the blood symbolically, the blood of Jesus, we are actually taking the life uh, that is in Jesus and the power that there is in, um, in the blood of Jesus Christ. And that blood, with it, we overcome the enemy. They overcame the enemy by the blood of a lamb. And I pray that this season, every enemy, enemy tendency, every extension of demonic activities over this season, over your life, your career, your business, your children, your uh, life generally, you will overcome that by the blood of a lamb. I, re, I declare that that life continues to get released as you enjoy uh, the blood um, of the cup, uh, through the cup that we continue to share over this season. Now, the other thing that uh, communion does is that it cures negative emotions. Did you know that? It cures negative emotions. If you're there and you're uh, struggling and wrestling with depression, with stress, and, and you just feel, man, I, I, I just can't seem to mobilize enough strength to mentally keep my head up uh, over, above the things that are happening. The stuff that's going on with my business, the stuff that's going on with my life and my family and uh, my career that I just can't seem to be able to master around this time. And so... Uh, one of the things that Jesus did, uh, 1 Corinthians 11, verse number 23 and forward, of course we know that time was a time of betrayal. Jesus knew that he was going to be betrayed. Just before, uh, you know, uh, they took the last meal, they introduced communion, he knew that that was his last meal. One of the reasons why he brought that meal was actually because betrayal was coming. He knew the disciples were going to depart from him. Uh, he was going to be denied. He was going to find himself alone. And so one of the ways he needed power, one of the uh, expressions of power that he needed is to actually be stabilized emotionally. Jesus knew that that cup was not easy. And that's why he was pleading with his father, saying, take away this cup, uh, but not let my will, but let your will be done. And so he knew that he was going to be thrown into a roller coaster of emotions around that season. And one of the ways Jesus anchored himself is by serving the bread and the cup 
the communion. One of the ways you need to anchor yourself, sometimes as you get frantic, a little afraid, uh, you get emotionally unstable, one of the ways to stabilize yourself again is through uh, the bread and the cup. And you see, when you take communion with this understanding and revelation, it allows you to be lifted above the things that are beating us and pushing us left, right, and center. And how I pray that as you understand and connect to this revelation, that these things are going to tune in into your life uh, in the name of Jesus. Now, the other thing that it does is that uh, communion is that it proclaims victory. It proclaims victory. It is a way, it's a way of declaring symbolically that I am victorious. See, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 11, 26, that we, when we take the cup and when we eat the bread, we proclaim the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. See, the death and the resurrection of Jesus is actually uh, when powers and forces are pulling you down, they are seeking to take you under, Jesus went there where everything pulls us down, including the enemy of death, where it pulls us, uh, you know, he was taken down there. He went there and said, look, it doesn't matter what pulls people down and my children down. I will go there to where people are pulled down, to death, to the grave. And what I will do is I will go there and proclaim my power and my victory. And so the Bible says, when we eat and drink, of uh, the emblems, we're actually proclaiming the death and the resurrection of Jesus. That's simply victory. And of course, we know he bled from seven points. And those were seven expressions of victory from our mind, mentally, uh, you know, to our struggles as he bled from his face, you know, struggling in prayer, the garden of Gethsemane, uh, you know, to the hands, to the side, uh, you know, to the feet and to the back as he was being whipped. All those are expressions of different kinds of victory. And that's a story of victory. And so when you take communion over this time, and I could go on with this uh, wonders of communion. Now, when we take communion with understanding, we're actually proclaiming victory. It's a way of saying my business will be victorious. My health will be victorious. My finances will be victorious. Everything around me this season will be victorious. It, has, it does no harm for you to take communion every day over the season. And you don't need necessarily a pastor serving you. You can pray for those emblems, sanctify them uh, by faith. Just trust God that you will enjoy what he is doing. And, uh, you know, and the power that is tied behind uh, communion symbolically and have a state for you and your family and your business and your children and whatever else you may want to connect uh, with um, this uh, season. And so allow me to just uh, pause there as far as communion is concerned, the wonders of communion. I'll pause there. But all this is just to remind you, boy, this is powerful. This is a powerful ordinance that Jesus left as well. One of the ways to soar with wings like eagles and refuse to uh, put our, our tail between our, our legs over this season is by allowing the power and the wonder of communion uh, to take charge and effect over your life. And I pray as you do that with the revelation over this season, God's power and grace uh, will rest over you in the name of Jesus Christ. Now, the next thing that, uh, the next anchor, uh, point number two, but I believe it's a uh, point number 12 for you, is um, take up the shield of faith. Take up the shield of faith. Now, faith is actually a shield. And there are things that you will not be shielded from if you drop your faith. And did you know uh, faith, the Bible says that we, we are to take up. And that suggests there are things that can come and faith falls by itself. There are things that can come at you and you actually throw away faith yourself, willingly. It doesn't just fall because your hands have gotten weak of holding faith. Some things are happening right now and they are weakening the hands of some Christians. And so faith is just falling by itself from their hands. For other people, uh, you know, because of a shaking now that is going on, they have seen things and there are people who have heard, uh, you know, uh, stories and comments from their bosses and so on and so forth. And they've actually threw away the confidence. It hasn't just, fall, it hasn't just fallen from them. They've actually willingly thrown it away. 
All right. Now, there are others that, you know, they will hear things and go through stuff over this season. And because of what they will go through, you know, they will just feel they cannot, they just don't have the ability to hold on to faith. And so you're going to be subjected to things that will test your ability to hold on to the confidence that you have in Jesus and to the faith that you have in Christ Jesus. And I want to just remind you, I want to just remind you that um, you need faith. You need faith. You need faith over this season. And so that shield of faith must, we must hold on to it. Now, did you know, without faith, God does not do mighty things. Mark chapter number 6, verse number 1 to 6. There's an interesting story there. Mark 6, uh, 1 to 6. It says, when Jesus came into his hometown, the people there, were they took him lightly. They were unable to mobilize faith to believe him. Why? Because they knew. They said, is this not the son of so-and-so? Is not... Uh, are not his brothers and sisters so and so and so they were unable to hold on to faith and so the bible says because of what they saw and what they experienced the way they had experienced jesus and the way they saw jesus they were unable to mobilize faith and sometimes because of what comes around you and how you relate with it and how you see it and perceive it sometimes faith can flow, fall through your fingers just the way it happened in the hometown of jesus and so when faith is allowed to slip through your fingers, the Bible says in that time and in that city of Nazareth, Jesus could do no mighty things. Why? Because faith, people there could not hold on to faith because of the familiarity that, you know, they had with Jesus. And so faith can be dropped. And when it is dropped, when it is dropped, when faith is dropped, then God is unable. To do mighty things. Uh, of course it goes on to say in uh, Ephesians chapter number 3 verse number 20. That God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above what we can ask or imagine. According to the power that works within us. So the power that works within us. Uh, of course earlier on there. Um, uh, I believe verse number 18 is talking about. The power that works within us is a power of faith. And so. The amount of um, power, God's greatness, that can be revealed to you and will be revealed to you this season will depend on how much faith you're holding on to. How much faith you're holding on to. And I want to remind you that if you allow what you're hearing, what you're seeing, the atmosphere around you, the stories that have come, reports about how, uh, you know, Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa will drop. The number of millions of people that will be pushed to poverty because of this pandemic. The number of years will be pushed back as far as development is concerned. All those reports have come and we appreciate the professionals who are studying these kinds of things to help us appreciate, uh, you know, what will happen to us. But you see, you can allow these things to cause you to drop your faith and include yourself in that. But you can also come and declare your eyes will open up. You see what to do, how to do it, and know what to do over this season so that your faith will not, uh, you know, so that you will not go down with the rest of the people. And so I want to just remind you, faith must not be dropped. Uh, Hebrews chapter number 3 Verse number 5 and 6, uh, it says, And Moses indeed was faithful in all his house as a servant, for a testimony of those things which would be spoken afterward, but Christ as a son over his house, whose house we are if we hold fast. If we hold fast to the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope, firm to the end. And so the confidence that we have in the promises of God and the faith that we have in the person of Jesus and what he's able to do that is able to come even into dead situations. He's able to come even into a stormy seas and lift us up. When we hold to the very end that confidence, then God will do mighty things. Hebrews chapter number three, verse number 14 says, we are partakers of Christ if we hold our confidence steadfast to the end. So there are things that will come to try and wrestle faith out of you. 
they will come and try and say, you cannot hold on to your faith anymore. Now, as they wrestle faith out of your hands, the Bible says we must hold our confidence steadfast uh, to the very end. Uh, and the Bible says when we do that, we will become partakers. We will become partakers. Now, Hebrews chapter number 10, verse number 35 and 36, it says, don't cast away your confidence. Now, you see, there are things people are going to see this season and they willingly cast away the faith. They say, boy, the whatever I've seen happening, businesses, there's no whatever. And if you watch the news last night, they already warned us and they said, Kenyans, uh, brace yourselves for tough times they are coming. Uh, over and above the uh, COVID pandemic and its related challenges, we're also going to have issues, big issues of food insecurity. Prices will shoot up. And you see, you may hear these things and you allow them to cause your faith to cast away your confidence to cast away your faith and decide, you know what? Uh, for me, I will not, I will not hold on to the confidence. And all, I, I, I'm bringing out this to just tell you, you know, there is a faith you must, you must master as a shield. The Bible says that faith uh, that we have in Jesus is actually a shield, a shield that keeps away things that want to come and limit us and fight against us and the bible is very clear that faith is actually a shield is a shield uh, to us and may that shield not be punctured over this season and may that faith just rest over you and cause you to uh, be shielded from all kinds of arrows that are flying around over this season next anchor that i will bring to us uh, today uh, is stay in the word closely related to faith you see your faith will not be fed if you're not staying in the word and uh, you see what you will need what you will need this time is to refresh yourself on the promises of God now there are places where we have we have promises promises did you know the Bible says that in Psalm 91 verse number 4 that the word of God again is another shield. The word of God is another shield. That word of God is a shield. So that shield of the word of God stops certain things that come to us. Now Psalm 91 verse number 4 says, He shall cover you with his feathers and under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and your buckler. His truth shall be your shield and your buckler shield and buckler now what does that mean shield and buckler shield when you're going to war you needed a big shield all right you needed a big shield so that when people shoot whatever it is they're shooting from very far you know the big shield covers you but when you needed to uh, come out of you know uh, the place where you shielded, of course, so that you can see because a big shield meant you can't see very well, you know, past the shield. So what, what it meant um, uh, for you when uh, you were, uh, you know, behind the shield, vision and clarity was limited. So sometimes you needed to pull out of the shield, but you needed to go with a smaller shield so that as you shoot or engage, you know, you could also protect yourself from whatever it is that they are shooting as it comes your direction. And so... All of that, as it, as it came your direction, you needed both a shield and a small buckler, as it were. And can you imagine the Bible is saying the truth, God's word, and that truth, this word, is your shield and is your buckler. It's both the big protection and also the small convenient protection. Uh, you know, against the small arrows and things when you pull out uh, from where the big shield is so that you can do business. And I want to tell you, and I, I hope you hear this, that the word of God, this is a time to read the word of God. The promises God's word brings to us. Psalm 91, that's a scripture, a chapter maybe now you should know by heart. That you should trust God that it will settle in your heart. This is a time to call out as many promises as possible. Because when you call them out and you believe them, 
that word of God becomes your shield. You see, if you're going to be found with no word ruminating over your life, the Bible says in Psalm 1 that when we meditate on the word of God and speak it and declare it day and night, when we declare that word day and night, what happens? The Bible says that it turns us to be like a tree that is planted by the rivers, that continues to bear its fruit in its season, and its fruit does not wither. So if God's word over your life, if God's word over your life is scanty over this season, and you're not, you don't have promises bubbling in your spirit, there's a shield that will be lacking spiritually. There's a buckler that will be lacking. And so this is a time to fill your spirit with the word of God, with promises, with the word of God, with positions that we have, the authority that is given to us, the things that Jesus did. It's a time to come through the gospel. Just see what Jesus did. Refresh and, and fill your spirit with the things that Jesus did when he lived here on earth, how he operated above the things that came his life, how he's able to go through people that wanted to kill him when they were there properly armed, but he went between them and through them and around them, then they did not harm him. This is the time to call for those things into practice and uh, to let those things bubble in your spirit. If you're found with little deposits of God's word, there are things that will have power over your life. You see, Candlelight is still light, but if you take candlelight and put it in a hall, in a big auditorium, it will be almost useless. If you take a lantern and you want to light a stadium with a lantern, yes, it is light, but it will be useless. If you light a matchstick, yes, that is still light, but it will be useless. Now, if you only have scanty little word inside of you, it may be light, yes, but with what is happening, you need a floodlight. You need a floodlight. And so, uh, turn on the floodlights of the Word of God over the season. Don't just have a five minutes time of studying the Word and proclaiming it. Boy, turn on the floodlights. Turn on the floodlights. There's a darkness around now that needs to find a big shield. That needs to find very effective back backlers that you are able to work with. I declare over your life, as I just close partly this set of, um, of, uh, of, of, of um, anchors that I've been sharing, I pray that God will anchor you. That as others go down, the righteous are not permitted to go down with the whirlwind. The Bible says, when the whirlwind passes, the wicked are no more. But the foundation of the righteous remains stable even after the whirlwind has passed. As a child of God, it's an insult to God for you to go down. Be simply because a wild wind has come. Your foundation needs to be stable. How do you ensure your foundation is stable? Uh, you run with the principles and the anchors that we've been sharing over the past couple of weeks. From next Sunday, I'll begin to show you something. And there's a wild God's lady in my heart. Um, this time, not anchors, but just a way, you know, collective things that I want to say to you as we exit uh, from this season and as we continue to just navigate around this stormy season that you will arrive fine. Smelling of no smoke, uh, no scorch by the fire in any way. That is possible. And I pray and declare the fourth man continues to join you. That the light and the grace of heaven sits over you and ensures you successfully get to the other side. Our Father, in the name of Jesus, declare that every child of God has tuned in this morning to hear your word and to connect to these anchors and principles. I declare that, Lord, as they run with these anchors that we find in your word and are given to us as divine wisdom, that, Lord, the lives of your children are going to be anchored. Businesses and careers, our children of God, will be held together. There will be stability that will ensure that the foundation of the righteous will not be shaken uh, by this whirlwind. Lord, we receive this. I declare it over your children and I uh, uh, pronounce today that that comes to manifestation as we run with and as we hard and as we run with this word. We thank you, Lord, and we receive it and call it done. And all God's children shouted, Amen and amen. I declare that your foundations will remain stable and the light of heaven continues to slay 
uh, every power, satanic powers that are at work around this season. May the Lord keep you. May he preserve you. May the face and the light of his countenance shine upon you. And may he grace you to navigate and to arrive safely and free from everything that is flying around over this season. God bless you and stay safe. Until next week, uh, stay blessed. Amen. Mm -hmm.